This episode is brought to you by our wonderful and generous sponsors, ZipRecruiter, Serial Box, and Hymns. Empty Frames is an independent production. The commentary expressed here is our own and does not reflect the opinions of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum or its staff. To learn more about the museum, including the 1990 theft, please visit the museum's website at www.isgm.org. If you have any critical information relating specifically to the 1990 theft, please contact the museum's security director via the options provided on the museum's website. The museum continues to offer a reward totaling $10 million for information that can lead to the return of the stolen artwork. We are bothered by the loss the art world suffered in 1990, and we are not content with the status quo. One stolen painting to note is from Manet, a French artist who created Che Tortoni, circa 1880. It's an elegant depiction of a man sketching a half-consumed beer on the table as he calmly looks at his audience. We started this podcast to raise awareness of the theft and to show our support for the ongoing recovery efforts. While those recovery efforts progress as they do daily, we encourage our listeners to visit the museum, to appreciate its incredible collection, both past and present, and to donate directly to the museum through its website. Again, if you enjoy this podcast and you feel as we do about the missing artwork, the most productive way for you to express your view is to donate directly to the Gardner Museum via its website. Go to isgm.org and look for the Join and Give tab, where there are options to make a donation of any size to support the museum's mission. Please donate today. And when you do, let us know on Twitter so we can personally thank you there. Thanks again. March 18, 1990, the most audacious art heist of all time took place at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Two men dressed as police officers were admitted into the building by security, claiming to be responding to a disturbance call. In 81 minutes, 13 pieces of art were stolen. Among the portraits stripped from their frames were works by Vermeer, Degas, and Rembrandt. Estimated at half a billion dollars, the heist has been categorized as the largest and most frustrating of all time. Theories of their whereabouts and those who perpetrated the crime are abundant. In this podcast series, we will dig as deep as possible into the case, the theories, and the social and economic impact the greatest unsolved art heist of all time had on the community. This is Empty Frames, a heist story. Welcome back to Empty Frames. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios. What's up, Lance? What's going on, Tim? Episode 5, here we are. It's awesome. Yeah. I'm feeling fantastic about it. Pumped about this interview and pumped about where this show is going so far. And this interview, Lance, is with a wonderful writer, wonderful woman named Liz Lenz. I like the direction that this is going. We are steering just a bit away from the theft itself because ultimately we don't want to fully concentrate on the theft. We want to concentrate a bit on the museum and on the amazing woman who the museum was built by and who was the original curator and director, Isabella Stewart Gardner, the scandalous Isabella Stewart Gardner. Yeah, so her life is really fascinating. And we have Liz, who wrote a great article for Vice about uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner. So we talked to her about her article and about the research she has done into Ms. ISG. Right, and how ISG would fit in today and sort of a comparison of, of who she would be like and what she would be like today. And the article is The Scandalous Legacy of Isabella Stewart Gardner, Collector of Art and Men. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Please enjoy this episode about Isabella Stewart Gardner. We will be back in episode six with more heist talk with Ulrich Boser. So follow us on Twitter at empty underscore frames. We're on Instagram and Facebook as well. This is something that we were really excited about because when we first uh, got involved in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist, 
you hear the name Isabella Stewart Gardner, and most people associate her with the museum and then to the heist. However, you are a big fan of Isabella Stewart Gardner, and you and your, your yes, you're very excited to talk about her, so I'm going to pass this off to you. Who is Isabella Stewart Gardner to you? She is a very interesting woman. She was in so many ways ahead of her time, but also repressed by her time. And she was so complicated. And um, the museum is, I think, her way of trying to uh, tell her story in a world where she didn't really have the means to do that. And by means, I don't mean she didn't have money. I mean that she didn't have the... um, the authority, like the narrative control over her own life. So she fascinates me as a mother. She fascinates me as a daughter, as a partner, and as a very complicated, badass woman. So, And you said before we recorded, uh, that was a very formal answer, but your first answer before we recorded <laughs> oh, right. was what? She's my BFF from beyond the grave. There you go. <laughs> So you you mentioned she was a mother. I guess let's start there. Um, She wasn't a mother for long, though, was she? No, um, that, you know, that's such a tragedy of her life. And actually, um, when I was thinking about it and thinking about talking about her, I really think that that the loss of her son, who died when he was um, two years old, he was born on June 18th, 1863, and then he died just two years later. Um, And ISG surrounded herself with men, right? And this all kind of started after the loss of her son. And I really think that there, that was a profound, it had a profound impact on her life. I went to the museum right after I had <laughs> had a miscarriage, and uh, and I and I remember going there and being in this room, the one where I think it's red and it has all these like images of Mary and Jesus, and just really kind of feeling that profound loss. Um, do you, do you mind if I read a section of Madame Bovary because I think it really explains what a son would have meant to Isabella Stewart Gardner. When Emma Bovary is thinking about why she wants a boy, she thinks a man at least is free. He can explore every passion, every land, overcome obstacles, taste the most distant pleasures, but a woman is continually thwarted, inert and pliant. At the same time, she must struggle against both the softness of her flesh and subjection to the law. Her will, like the veil tied to her hat by a string, flutters with every breeze. But it reminded me of that picture that um, Sargent painted of ISG later in life, where, you know, the white frothy one with the veil. And so um, I think there was a lot of that, that that son symbolized an avenue of freedom. And then when he died, I think a lot was taken away from her. So this loss sort of inspired her to throw herself into art, perhaps, or collecting art? Yeah, so right after um, her son dies, um, she's very depressed, and uh, she and her husband go on this tour of Europe, and it's kind of like a rebirth for her. She's always been a little headstrong, um, doesn't fit in well with Boston society before, but after um, her son dies and she goes on this great trip all over Europe. Um, she's, she's a phenomenal traveler, just throws herself into everything and, uh, and finds the, um, the designer Charles Worth to make her these like tight, sexy gowns. And when she comes back to Boston, she's just like, just the talk of the town, um, because she's wearing all these sexy dresses. She's yelling, she's laughing, she's, dancing a lot <laughs> she was laughing and dancing all those scandalous things <laughs> according to one newspaper um isabella was coming up the stairs at a party when an older man said to her pray who undressed you and how did she reply uh she said worth didn't he do a fabulous job <laughs> i don't even understand what that expression means pray who undressed you pray was like a um may i please 
like can i can i add like i i beseech you pray right like, and so you know it's like at the oscars like who dressed you who are you wearing and so that's the pun right who undressed you but she loved it she loved that that kind of attention she loved creating controversy she loved making people talk about her and in some ways i think she was like proto kardashian right she became this like person famous for being famous so you wrote an article in uh for broadly which is a that's a division of vice right Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, titled Isabel, The Scandalous Legacy of Isabella Stewart Gardner, Collector of Art and Men. And the uh, line underneath is, long before the gallery she built was famously robbed, Isabella Stewart Gardner was shocking 19th century society with her disregard for convention. Her disregard for convention was not only in the way she dressed and behaved, but she wasn't, like you said, she came back and she was almost famous for being famous. After her husband's death, what did she what did she do? How did she like immerse herself in the museum? I think that really made her think about legacy, right? How she wanted to be remembered. And before her husband's death, she had been one of the scandalous things she'd done is cavort with all these artists. And um, and she had dabbled in art collecting, but then after um, after her husband's death, she really became obsessed with this idea of uh, creating the museum. And uh, she was very heavy handed in it, right? Like she needed to see where every brick was laid and every stone. And there's that story about her having like one wall taken down four times just so it could be exactly the way she wanted it. And, uh, and, you know, and then now that it's here, she has it so that no piece of art can be moved because this is exactly what she wanted. There's a writer, Patricia Vigderman, who wrote a book about Isabella Stewart Gardner, who calls the museum the memory palace of Isabella Stewart Gardner. And I really like that because I think that's it's, you know, her legacy and it's who she wants people to see her as, which is interesting because I'm not sure if it's exactly who she was, but it's it's who she wants, who she wants, you know, us now to see her as. Interesting. So she she was concerned with her image and her legacy or maybe not concerned. Yeah, I think it you know, I, I think it's this idea of, you know, telling a story or being part of a narrative. She was always around artists, writers. It was Henry James who called her a locomotive with a Pullman car attached. He, he like would hang out with her and then get really irritated with her and then go away and then find her again. So I think that like explains how frustratingly magnetic she was. Are you hiring? Posting your position to job sites and waiting and waiting for the right people to see it? That is just such a challenge. If you're looking for the right people, I mean, you need the great talent and you need a way to find them. You're absolutely right, Lance. And ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. Well, I heard, as a matter of fact, that 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in, in just, just one, one day. day. You heard I, the same thing. I heard thing. the same thing. That's so cool. Word, words on the street. As we know, the right candidates are out there, but ZipRecruiter is how you can find them. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, seriously, free. How do they do that? So you just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash empty. That's it. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash empty empty yeah don't leave it empty after the slash write the word empty for the podcast empty frames so to be clear that ziprecruiter.com slash e m p t y empty ziprecruiter the smartest way to hire (laughs) 
I have one quote that says, Mrs. Jack Gardner is one of the seven wonders of Boston. She is a millionaire <laughs> bohemian. She is eccentric and has the courage of eccentricity. She is the leader of the smart set, but often leads to where none dare follow. And she was, she was famously uh, known for saying, don't spoil a good story by telling the truth. Right. <laughs> it's in in your article. We we, we have uh, moments where you know Isabella uh, smokes cigarettes, and she would take lions from the zoo for a stroll down Tremont Street. Down Tremont Street, which is a a pretty major street in Boston. A pair of lions. Yeah. Tell us a, like about that. Okay, that's one of the stories that I think in the in the biographies that you read about her, that might be more rumor mill than actual truth. But uh, yeah, that's the rumor that she would go to the zoo and take the lions out for a walk. What other crazy stories like that are there? I, I read one that uh, she had a, a boxing match in her living room. Yes, she hosted a boxing match at her home. And while the men fought, she danced. And she had two large diamonds attached to wires in her hair, and they bounced around. That's the story. Um, like antenna? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think it was like a little bit more like... Uh, elegant than just like two random diamond antennas. And then there's the other story about her showing up to the Boston Symphony Orchestra wearing a headband that declared OU Red Sox and inviting the Harvard football team to her home after they beat Yale. Um, So she was just a woman who um, courted the world. So she was ahead of the curve on this uh, Boston and New York rivalry, though. <laughs> because... Well, she was from New York. Right. Um, well, she, so... uh, exactly. And then she's rooting for the Red Sox and wore a headband when right after they beat the New York Giants in 1912. Well, she I knew the Yankees sucked then. And they <laughs> sucked <now>, so... <laughs> Thank you for that. It's got to be crazy you know... to hear these stories as a young woman now and and think that she shows up at that at symphony hall wearing a headband that says oh you red Sox," and you know it's this uh it's this monocle shattering moment and or like you say this like pearl clutchy moment where people yeah. are gasping like oh my <laughs> you know like i have never and <laughs> and she's just like laughing it off and smoking cigarettes how how relevant is is isg today when we're talking about about these about Strong these freedoms? women yeah and freedom yeah You know, I think uh, so relevant and it's really not that hard to imagine the impact she had on society because I think any woman who's ever, you know, asserted herself in any sort of masculine realm understands the frustration and the pullback. And yes, the things that she was doing don't necessarily seem so radical. Perhaps now, uh, you know, some of the charges leveled against her were dancing too much ice skating in the public gardens, uh, smoking. Uh, <laughs> she rode horseback? Yeah. Yes, she rode horse. She oh, rode my her horse, God. Was it uh, side saddle? Bareback in Brooklyn. <gasps> Brooklyn. <gasps> yeah. So, um, right, like, oh, grab your pearls. I <laughs> am. Uh, you are grabbing your pearls, yes. Um, thanks for wearing them. They're my, uh, they make this outfit. <laughs> <laughs> But so I don't think it's like it's that far removed because even now, I mean, sports is still a very masculine space, um, e- even though many women are, you know, fans and kind of trying to occupy that space. It's still a space of men. And if it was and if it's now, then it was before. So she was this woman who was very consciously putting herself into these male spaces and trying to dominate them and uh, with the with the power and influence and the money that she had. So I find her really relatable as, you know, I'm I'm a woman with ambition. You know, I know what I know what it's like to want to tell your own story and not have people be receptive to it or try to change you and mold you into the version of you that they want you to be. Um, and and that's just the constant battle, right? To kind of be yourself in a world that's telling you to be something else. So I think that that's just as relevant now as it has ever been. 
What I also love about her is that she's not perfect, right? She's very problematic. She was not an abolitionist. She, you know, she and her husband did not uh, support the North during the Civil War. She was born in New York. Yes. She was born on April 14th. In 1840, you just reminded me when you said that she was 25-ish when the Civil War was going on. So we're, she's 25 in 1865. That's, that, that is so hard to, to wrap your head around how, how much gall it took how, to, to be the person she was in 1865. Let's put her in historical context. She's not the only, you know, brave woman. Uh, Victoria Woodhull is around. Right. Um, there are, uh, you know, women are fighting for suffrage. Uh, women were leading the cause uh, for abolition. So um, I think sometimes when we look at history, we think, oh, well, that was, you know, this really antiquated time. We, are we so lucky we're not like that now? And really, like, the distance between the past and the future is so small. Um, it's it's really not that different. And uh, while Isabella Stewart Gardner was part of, like, the ruling class of women, uh, so it was a little different for her to be this person in this level of society, you have to remember there were a lot of fun and interesting women who were, you know, fighting for freedom, for votes, for suffrage. There were psychics. Um, there were Victoria Woodhull was trying to become the uh, the first female president. So in a lot of ways, it's not that different than it was today. That was literally the best answer that I, <laughs> I could have wanted for that. That Isabella Stewart Gardner was amongst a, a, a wave of revolutionary women. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that she didn't really cavort with them, right? There's not a lot of evidence of her, you know, being part of like the women's movement of the time. She was very much uh, separated herself from all of that. Um, she led by example. I don't even, you know, I mean. I don't even think she's consciously trying to lead. I liken her more to like a Kim Kardashian than like a Hillary Clinton, right? Because she's not consciously trying to lead a movement. The bitch just wants to be herself. Like she doesn't want to like, she doesn't want political change. She doesn't want like, you know, religious freedom. Like she doesn't care about anybody else but herself. And she just wants to be free. Um, Sorry. Sorry, ISG. We just got to call it like we see it. <laughs> <laughs> she seemed like effortlessly kind of cool, though. Effortlessly cool or effortlessly revolutionary. Yeah. Because I think she worked really fucking hard at being cool. Like, she, I mean, like she didn't she wasn't as rich as all those women and she had to buy like art and she, you know, had you know, Sergeant paint her, uh, to like cultivate her image. She was buying all these gowns. Like, no, you know, like, it's so funny because there's that like mythos of women. Like everybody's like, Oh, it doesn't look like she's wearing makeup. She's so like effortlessly beautiful or effortlessly cool. Like that doesn't fucking exist. <laughs> like any woman, like anything that looks effortless for a woman is like, like years and years of like like plotting and journaling and you know applying eyeliner and watching YouTube videos. So I'm sorry to that's fair. correct you on that, but no, that's no, fair. It's well, it's a it's an interesting comparison to say that she's a leader, and then you you compare her to say Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Warren, who have been um, putting themselves together as that type of political leader. From mm -hmm. what it seems to me, after reading uh, about ISG and and uh, you know in in the Gardner Heist book and in your uh, your writings on it on her, she's a she's a she's a trailblazer. She wants to be herself, but mm -hmm. perhaps not so much understanding the implications that would happen years and years later. She seems to me to be a person who's living in the moment. 
Yeah, I think sometimes, and this is one of the reasons I'm drawn to her, is that sometimes there is nothing more radical than a woman doing exactly what she wants. And I see that in ISG. She's just a woman doing exactly what she wants. And it blows everybody's minds. You saying that she's a woman who just wants to do exactly what she wants and it blows everybody's mind reminds me of uh, the the painting that she had, uh, John Sargent's painting that she had. John Singer Sargent has a painting in the ISGM, the museum, El Haleo. Yeah. Yes, yes. The ruckus. Right. Translation. Yep. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So ISG loved Sargent, um, John Singer Sargent, and um, they had this relationship that was like very close and very intense. Uh, you know, there's stories about them uh, playing tag in the hallways, which is, I mean, that's a little, I mean, they're, they're grownups. They're not like 10 <laughs> and they're like, they're like in their fifties and they're playing tag in the hallways. So it's very close. Um, and uh, make of that what you will. She has him paint her, but she also collects his, uh, his paintings. And the one that I love the most, because it's so breathtaking, when you walk into the museum and there's this little side room, um, I'm sure you've seen it, and you walk into the room and it's just this big wall size picture of this woman dancing. And uh, in the background, there's, you know, musicians, the men are like very dark, the male musicians, they're like kind of shadowed. And it's just this woman with all the light on her. And she's in this like weird, impossible position. It's hard to contort your body into like how exactly she's holding her hands. If you've tried, and I have tried because I love the picture. And again, it's an image of a woman just trying to be herself, I think. Oh, I don't I don't want to be too reductive. Like I'm sure art historians are listening to this being like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but, <laughs> but But she obviously um, felt connected to the character in this painting. Not only the character in the painting, but the painter because she commissioned this guy, John Singer Sargent, to paint several of portraits of her. And, and Sargent was also a man who was drawn to complicated women. Some of his best portraits were of uh, these like really complicated and in many ways revolutionary women. And if um, you're interested, there's this wonderful book, Sargent's Women by Donna M. Lucy, that talks about some of the women he painted. And, you know, <laughs> one woman in here, I forget her name, but she... Uh, after Sargent paints her portrait and she lives this long life and she's 80 and she seduces a 24 year old man away from his, uh, his wife. So like when you talk about complicated women, Sargent loved them and he was so good at painting them and capturing them. So yeah. So the, the El Haleo, the ruckus is this painting in the ISG museum that I think is even more this is my own personal bias, but even more than the pictures that Sargent painted of ISG, I think this one really encapsulates her spirit um, because it's just this woman doing this impossible thing all alone. And you even say that Isabella was a ruckus and she probably saw herself as a ruckus. She was a ruckus. She couldn't help but being a ruckus. And I think she really learned to embrace that. One more quick thing on that painting. If you look at the shadow of the woman in the background, it is reminiscent. It's not very detailed as a bird, but it's very reminiscent of a bird if you look at that shadow behind her. Or it could be a stain on the wall, but I always thought it was a, a shadow. Yeah, I never noticed the shadow. Well, I never noticed that it was a shadow or it could be a sort shadow. Sort of looks like her. wings. But it does. Yeah, I see what you're saying there for sure. It's a, it's a great painting. I remember when we went to the museum, that was one of the ones that we uh, gravitated towards as well. I mean, we could do a whole episode on this painting. Easily, easily. Yeah. And also notice how the other women in the background are, they don't like, I think they're supposed to be like dancing with her, but they almost seem to be like lamenting. You know what I mean? Like they're almost like throwing their hands up and like, you know, like why? Yeah, exactly. They're dancing together, but the, the focus of the, of the painting is not dancing with them. 
So she's dancing right. alone. She doesn't give a crap about anybody else in the painting. She doesn't. Yeah. She doesn't. Yeah, she it, um, it, um, it almost looks like her force is like knocked them over or is knocking them back. Seems like it's inspired them to dance. It's inspiring yeah, me to like, dance. It's very much <laughs> like the way she's leaning. She's being propelled forward. Um, and all the light is on the lower half of her body, which I think is is interesting because where's the light coming from in this picture? It seems to be kind of like reflecting up from, you know, the the ground up onto her as opposed to above. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just, she's not like a saint, you know, it's not like this like heavenly light glowing around her. It's this like lower light lighting up her legs, like her lower body. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very evocative and I love it. Empty Frames is sponsored by Serial Box and Adaptive Studios. And False Idols, Lance, is a new serial from Serial Box. Oh, here she is again, Layla L. Deeb. That's uh, your girl. She goes deep undercover, though, which is funny. They're kind of a play on the name. But she poses as an heiress in the Middle East. And she must infiltrate the highest echelons of society in order to trace priceless art relics from their millionaire owners back to illegal digs and the terrorist groups profiting from their sales. Well, that's very relatable to anybody listening to Empty Frames. They're, they understand what it's like to lose such valuable pieces of property. Right. And here's another part. Layla's troubled past and growing feelings for an art dealer's son begin to complicate her judgment. And when she uncovers a terrorist plot threatening American and Egyptian lives, she must decide where her loyalties truly lie. What I really like about Adaptive Studios, Serial Box, and False Idols is the story advisor for this series was Robert Whitman, the man credited with inventing the FBI's art crime unit. Very cool. So you know it's legitimate and authentic. And hey, if he wants to be on our show, give us a ring. Please. NPR calls Serial Box the HBO of reading. And Adaptive Studios is an entertainment studio that reimagines how film, television, and digital projects are developed, produced, and distributed. Serial Box brings you gripping stories written by best-selling and award-winning teams of writers, similar to a TV show's writer's room. With new episodes released every week. You can read or listen to all serials at no extra cost. They have an app, too, which is cool. The Serial Box app lets you switch from listening to reading with just one click. I love that. False Idols will be released as a print book in early April. We're getting close to that now. Yep. Pre-orders available now wherever books are sold. Empty Frames listeners can get the series now with a 20% discount on the first season of False Idols today. Head to SerialBox.com slash Empty Frames. That's SerialBox, S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X dot com slash Empty Frames. Or go to the Redeem page and use code FRAMES18. That's the number one eight. Isabella enlisted the help of an art broker named Bernard Berenson, and he was an international uh, art dealer, I suppose. And so Mm -hmm. she bought a lot of her works of art through this guy. Can you tell us a little bit about their relationship? Yeah, so he was a younger man, and at at this point, Isabella is, what is she, like in her late 50s? She has this relationship with Bernard Bernson and um and 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 I think that he flirted with her more than anything. I think he flattered her. I think he made her feel good about herself. Um, and uh, and then used that to get rich um because then she gave him a shitload of money so he could smuggle, you know, paintings out of uh, you know, Italy and all these places. Um, and so it was, but it was mutually beneficial because maybe he fleeced her a little bit, but she also got art for a really good deal. And I mean, you look at that museum and what she did with the money she had, which was nothing compared to the other tycoons of the era. So she's like, Oh, I just have this little amount of money, but this, like, this is this cute little boy who will help me. And, uh, and so I feel like it was a very mutually beneficial relationship. And there was, um, there's a 
one of the biographies of ISG, it talks about like there being tension between Bernard Berenson and his wife whenever, you know, he talked about Isabella Stewart Gardner. So I think there's just like a little bit, which again, I think speaks to her magnetic and all consuming personality that she would just like suck people in and they didn't feel like they could get away. But now you use the word smuggle. You said that uh, that he gave is ISG gave her him money to buy these paintings and then smuggle them out. W- that implies something illegal took place. Oh yeah, I don't think I'm implying it. I think I'm saying it. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, all of art history is really just a story of you know stealing somebody else's you know art and bringing it to America. Well, not all of it, but like 75%, I think. Uh, please keep in mind my master's is in creative writing. <laughs> Noted. So when you get like angry emails from these like art historians, be like, look, she didn't know what she was talking about. She's insane. We'll never have her on again. Thank you for your time. Uh, <laughs> But no, like there was, so, you know, at at this time, Italy is is feeling very um, upset. They're starting to notice that their art is missing and that it's going to all these, you know, uh, upstart rich people in America and, you know, England. And so there's, there's a lot of laws being passed and it's getting harder and harder to get art out of um out of the places where it's you know where there's art and there's you know it's like frescoes being torn out of churches and she's a complicated woman she wanted this art and she got it and I think she understood what was happening because you know Berenson's telling her like it's getting a little tough might need a little extra help (laughs) getting some of this art out of here so I mean I don't want to get too many people who love ISG mad at me, but I think that's just the reality of any museum in America. If it has art from another country, you got to wonder how it got here. She overlooked a lot of um, a lot of a lot of things from him. Like he really had a good eye for art, and she yeah. knew that he had a good eye for art. So even if he was smuggling or you know quoting her a different price and skimming off the top she saw that as worth it right right she got it like I think she was a good business person you know she didn't um she was able to take again like I keep saying like she didn't have a lot of money like compared to the money of the gilded age she didn't have that much but what she did with it and how she managed it and a lot of this money was coming from that she inherited from her father um, who was a Scottish businessman and he kind of, uh, you know, he wasn't like a blue blood, like he had kind of been this like scrappy immigrant who made it, who made a bunch of money. And, uh, and then from her husband, she managed his money after he died to make this museum. And it, and it took quite a bit of her fortune to, to do all of that. It was, you know, I, in reading the biographies, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, she has to be a little bit more thrifty than, uh, than a Vanderbilt, but she makes it work. She didn't fuck around. Problem. Why do guys turn to weird solutions or do nothing when they can turn instead to medicine and science? I wish I had an answer for that. Do you? Do you have some sort of solution for this? I do. Oh, you do? Forhims.com. It's a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, sexual wellness for men. And Tim, thanks to science, ED can be optional. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical grade solutions to treat ED. Well known generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions to help you combat ED. No waiting room, no awkward doctor visits, no lines. You save hours by going to forhims.com. It's so easy. It sounds so easy and so convenient. We know how much guys just don't like to go to the doctors, especially for something like ED. You just answer a few quick questions and chat with a doctor for a confidential review. 
Hard made easy. Say hello to your little friend. Try Hymns for a month today for just $5. We'll get you started for just 5 bucks while supplies last. See website for full details. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or pharmacy. It's a reptile without the dysfunction. So go to forhymns.com slash frames, E-D. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash frames, E-D. For hymns.com slash frames ed. Now, Berenson suggested that she buy some of the best paintings in the museum and some, a lot of the ones that were stolen. So th- this list includes Titian's Rape of Europa, Rembrandt's yes. Self-Portrait, uh, the Degas sketches, the Manet, Che Tortoni, a, Rembrandt's A Lady and Gentleman in Black, and The Storm. Uh, but the best story about buying a painting was Vermeer's The Concert. This is one of my favorite parts from Ulrich Boser's book. Her art dealer was someone different than Bernard Berenson in this case. He would bid on her behalf. She sat in the back of the room, and she told him to put in offers in 50-franc increments as long as she kept her handkerchief up to her face. And uh, following directions, he placed bids as the price climbed past 25,000 uh, francs, 26,000, 27, 28,000. And Gardner stayed in the back of the room, kerchief over her mouth. He bid 29,000 francs, and the gavel went down. Later, Gardner said that she learned that both the Louvre in Paris and the National Gallery in London had tried to buy the painting and were displeased to find that they had been outmaneuvered by a private individual, an American woman, no less. And it made Gardner all the more proud. She's competitive, but I think what we're also maybe not talking about enough is that she had really good taste. And uh, she traveled the world. She was a good traveler. She would go to all these places. So I think her taste in art was really honed by this like cosmopolitan sense of the world and herself in the world. And uh, she was very canny. And you say in your article that she viewed all this as saving the art. You describe that a little bit? <sighs> yes. Um, again, this is one of my, like, I think this is speaks to the complicated uh, nature of Isabella Stewart Gardner and uh, how we view her today, um, which, you know, at the time she thought she was saving it, right? There's that whole um, that whole idea of, you know, the refined rich people saving the art and preserving it for history. And that's a little bit white savior um, nonsense. She viewed it as saving it, but also did she just want it and was she competitive and was she trying to build a legacy for herself? Yeah. So I think it was like a culmination of all of these things, but um, I think it would be too uh, unfair to like put too fine of a point on, oh, she was just saving the art because, you know, like in the paragraph you read, she was competitive. (laughs) She wanted to show people that she was better than them. What do you think ISG would be doing today? (sighs) That's hard to say because, I mean, there's what I want, what I would want from her, and then what I think she would be. Give us both. Okay. Um... (laughs) Uh, again, I think she'd be a celebrity who's famous for being famous. Um, well, this is not what I want. Um, this is what I think realistically she would be. I think that like ISG, they're not interested in being part of a movement. You know, they're not interested in in politics or revolution. They're just interested in being themselves. So that's why I would say that maybe more realistically, that's who she would be right now. But I think she'd be really compelling. Her Instagram would be phenomenal. <laughs> um, maybe maybe she'd be like a Chrissy Teigen, right? Who's just, whose Twitter is um, is the most beautiful thing in America right now. (laughs) But um, I mean, what I would want from her, obviously, I mean, obviously I'd want her to be like an Elizabeth Warren or a Hillary Clinton or a Christian Gillibrand, but I I don't think that that's 
realistic. I think she would be somebody who partied a lot, had a lot of complicated relationships with men and was in tabloids all the time and uh, had a lifestyle brand or something. What did she choose to serve at the opening of the uh, museum? She served champagne and donuts in Boston. You know, she knew her audience. Would you say that champagne and donuts would be two of her favorite food groups? I mean, aren't they everybody's favorite food groups? Well put. Yeah. 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 (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would I would say that um like how how fun is that, right? Like to just be like champagne, donuts. I think donuts were very um new and edgy then. So they weren't just like, you know, it's not like she just like walked down a Dunkin' and was like, whatever, 50 cake donuts, let's go. <laughs> but like <laughs> Um, you know, I think they were like all new and edgy, so it was like very hip of her to do that, but like if there was a party right now that was like champagne and donuts, I would fucking be there. So <laughs> donuts, donuts back then were like the kale of today. <laughs> no, no one really, no one really cares okay. until they're no, no, told no, it's cool. Even now, like even now, if somebody was like, "Come to my party," there's kale and champagne. No. I would be like, "Goodbye, we're not <laughs> friends anymore." Yeah, no, it's more like uh, the cronut of today or something like that, which is like this trendy <laughs> croissant oh. slash donut creation. Okay, but wasn't that like trendy like seven years ago? Well, see, that's Don't you live how... in the city? No, I'm I'm seven <laughs> I'm seven years past being cool. <laughs> Specifically seven years. Yeah. Like if you were to have a party at your museum, uh you that you're open you've opened up and you have all of these, what would you serve today that would be comparable to that? Or maybe maybe donuts are just like timeless. Donuts, much like the little black dress, will never go out of style. But um, if you're asking me personally what I would serve, I'd probably serve whiskey and like a variety of chips. Chips, potato chips. <laughs> yes, potato chips. Nice. But like, but like, you know, novelty flavors. How do you think she would handle the heist today? <sighs> Let's talk about the heist. This whole building, this whole art museum is her. It's her story. It's like if she wrote a memoir. And then, um, and the art heist, and I know you've talked about this, but it's so different than other art heists because the art was just ripped out of the frames, which is really violent. And if you think about how, again, this is an expression of a woman through time. It's almost like walking inside a ghost. It feels like walking inside that museum that um, and to have the art be ripped out. I think that it's a, it's, it's a violation. I think she would be really upset. Um, I, I, I mean, I guess there's, there's, well, there's that balance. I think she would love the notoriety. I think she'd love the stories. She'd watch all the documentaries. She would definitely listen to the podcast. But I think there would be real pain there because if you think about all the work she did to make this place and then just to have somebody walk in, they they didn't even care about the art. Well, that's my theory anyway. They just cut the Rembrandts out of the frames. It upsets me. (laughs) And I think it would really upset her because how um, how disrespectful, how rude. I always pictured her as like a storm if she ever found out about it. And then realizing, like you said, the notoriety that it's bringing the museum and her, she would appreciate that and, and do her best to capitalize on that in, in a reputational way. But But upon her hearing about it, I... I always pictured her like going into this tornado, the storm of of, Rage. Uh, of like how Fury. how dare they? How dare they invade this space? I think about it as more of like a deep, deep grief. Um, if you think about the losses she experienced and how did she handle those, um, she wasn't very public about it, right? She had she she lost her son, and she never talked about him again. Um, she had those nephews that she lost to suicide. She never 
talked about them. She really used her grief and her pain um, as a motivation, but not as it was not a public display. And that's where I think it, this gets so tricky because even though she was so public, she was deeply private about her pain. And I can see this kind of being channeled in that way too, you know, feeling very deeply, deeply hurt and full of grief about it, but also maybe not communicating that quite directly. All of your description of ISG really uh, wraps up in the in the model that hangs outside the museum. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. It translates to roughly, this is my pleasure, and this is my delight. And I think that that was her message for the whole museum, that this is this is beauty. This is what I love. And this is what I want to be remembered as. I think it's more revealing of her than she ever intended. You know, this woman controlled her legacy. She burned her private papers. She obsessed over where stones were placed in walls, where the art was going to be hung. But when you walk in there, I think that you can really get a sense of who she is in a way that perhaps she didn't quite uh, intend, like too much of her leaked through because she was just too much all the time. Um, And so when she, you know, when she says that this is my pleasure, this is my delight, I think it is, it is beautiful to look at it at face value and just honor it for what she intended. But I also think of it a little bit as a mystery, as like clues to who this complicated woman was. Um, and uh, and <laughs> the last time I was there at the museum, I was talking to one of the the security guards and he had this whole theory about like why she placed pictures where they were. Because if you looked at the eyeballs in every painting and then you'd have to like see where each person in the painting was looking and it was just like this complicated thing and so it was just interesting to me that I think I think that when you walk into that museum there's two mysteries going on there's the mystery of the heist but there's also the mystery of who this woman was and you have all the clues to unlock it you know, through the pictures that she chose, the way it was hung, the way she represents herself, and then the stories about her that she wanted people to know about. So it's fun to go in and have mystery there on two levels. Thank you for listening to Empty Frames a co-production of Crawl Space Media and Audio Boom. Original music by Jared Jensen and Kevin McLeod. Please learn more by going to EmptyFramesPodcast.com and CrawlSpacePodcast.com. Thank you very much for listening. Follow Empty Frames on Twitter at Empty underscore Frames. We're also on Facebook and Instagram as Empty Frames Podcast. We'll be back in two weeks with more from Ulrich Boser. Mashberg intentions are good. He starts to, to really create an incredibly powerful uh, narrative that's based in evidence. He sees stuff. When we look back, we're like, well, they, what they did deliver is, is paint chips from work that is of that time. That's pretty, that's pretty fascinating, but that isn't actually, you know, there are other proofs of life. I mean, if he had sent the finial, I think they would have believed him more.